uh, searching Southeast Asia's secrets. That's onomatopoeia, isn't it? Uh, Marco Mangostov joins us from uh, Luang Prabang in uh, Lao, which is right along the Mekong. It translates from uh, Lao to English as Big Buddha, Big Buddha, Luang Prabang. Yeah, um, that's um, you're always there. Every time I every time I see you leaving uh, uh, Hilo, you're off into Southeast Asia. What what are you there for? Well, I'm 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 there because it's here. And because there's more to learn here. And, uh, you know, I taught a course on uh, the politics of mainland Southeast Asia at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, spring quarter, last quarter. And I thought, well, uh, I still have more to learn. I'd like to be a better instructor. <clears throat> and, and also personally, Jay, I find, you know, the more time I spend here, and this is my fourth time in Laos, uh, third time in Luang Prabang, and, I just find the more time I spend, the more my roots get a bit deeper in terms of understanding the people, the culture, the history, the politics, uh, their concerns, and my understanding broadens and deepens. And uh, amongst the, the, the mainland Southeast Asian countries, because I don't know, I haven't been to Indonesia, Malaysia, I've been to Singapore, I've been to the Philippines or Brunei, but of mainland Southeast Asia, Lao is definitely my, my favorite. Uh, I find the energy and the vibe here uh, to be uh, the, the most agreeable to, to me at this point in my life. So it's just, uh, you know, like you, I want to continue to understand. I want to continue to learn for my own personal reasons and also so that um, hopefully not if, but when I teach my course again on Southeast Asia politics, uh, I'll have a greater depth and breadth uh, to do so. Well, what's your approach on, uh, on learning? I mean, I, I suppose uh, like so many of those, um, you know, American travel shows, you have a, a secret sauce in terms of your style, your approach to people, your way of engaging them, spending time with them, learning from them. Uh, what's your secret sauce on that, Michael? That's a great question, Jay. Great question. So what comes to mind is this. Uh, there's a, a ride uh, sharing service here in Lao called LOCA, L-O-C-A, LOCA. It's similar to Uber or Lyft. So you just go to the, uh, the Google Play Station or Play Store, you go to Apple and you download the Loca app. So I did that. And yesterday I traveled from the capital of Vientiane back to Luang Prabang on the super fast, uh, ultra modern Chinese fast train with a cost of six billion with a B, six billion dollars that they finished December of last year. So I sat in my hotel there in Vientiane and uh, the hotel wanted to charge me uh, big bucks to take me to the train station, which is about a half hour outside of town. So it's kind of in the boonies there in Vientiane. And I thought, well, I can do better than that. So I hailed a loca taxi and the dude was there. They're, they're typically young men. They're driving, you know, uh, uh, Toyotas or small uh, economy vehicles. And they're doing just like Uber drivers do all over the place. You know, they're making some bucks or making this case some, some kip. Wow, should kip is the currency. So the guy pulls up and I say he's in his mid 20s and speaks passable English. So we had a half hour together and I just peppered him with a whole bunch of questions. How long have you been doing this? Uh, why are you doing it? And then once you get people talking, as you know, because you make a, you know, as part of your vocation there to get people talking. Uh, once you get people talking and they feel that you're generally interested in what they have to say, that kind of can open the floodgates often. So I had this marvelous political conversation with this fellow, you know, young Laotian who uh, had spent some time outside of Laos studying IT in China. His dream is to come to Western Europe and work in IT, maybe even Switzerland. And but he didn't say come just, to the U.S. then, did he? No, he didn't, because the United States is more of a stretch, I think, for a lot of people, whereas I maybe mean, Europe is a bit. And plus, he had a good friend of his who ended up immigrating to Holland, to the Netherlands. So that kind of set the example for him. So, and, you know, and it's this, this, this dynamic where somebody divulges something and then you see, well, how far can I go in, in, in posing questions? And, you know, this, this is a dominant monopolistic Communist Party country here, one of five in the world, including China, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Cuba, and the Democratic uh, people, the uh, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. 
So, you know, people have to be careful what they say here. Uh, so, but I, you know, I, I finally asked and the question as we were pulling up the station. I said, to, you know, you're a young man and what's your take on in your lifetime? Will there be a pluralistic competition for power here? In other words, more than just the Communist Party, because this when you got a Communist Party, this monopoly control, there are no other choices. Right. And he said, yes, I do. I do. I think over time that there will be more choices here. So. You know, long winded answer to your question. I, I just I love to, to talk to people. I love to pose questions to people. I reached out to one of the political econ officers at our American embassy in Vientiane and had a marvelous guy. We spoke for about an hour and a half at a cafe in Vientiane uh, Friday of last week. You know, and, and this is, you know, the Foreign Service's finest because, uh, you know, it's not easy to get in the Foreign Service. There's a whole bunch of vetting and a whole bunch of evals that have to be done. So I always take advantage when I can to meet up with people at our embassy. And uh, I learned so very much. And uh, so whether it's a business owner, whether it's the person behind the desk at the hotel, whether it's the person driving the low cab, I just take an opportunity to kind of drill down a little bit. And sometimes they're more forthcoming or less forthcoming, but I always, always, always learn and it just enriches my understanding of, of the people, the place, the culture, and so forth. It's a challenge, isn't it? You know, you can't go beyond a, a certain line, not only, um, you know, with the driver you talked about, but, but you know, also with the, with the American diplomatic corps. You can't go beyond a certain line. They're not going to talk to you about some things. And so you have to connect the dots, don't you? I mean, I suppose that's true anywhere and everywhere you go, but especially when you're traveling like you travel, um, you know, you, you sort of gain a little information here, a little information there, start putting it together, and then you get on think tech and, and we can uh, examine that. Huh? <laughs> so what did you learn about the place? I mean, I, I totally appreciate the fact that you're always learning. Um, this is great. This is, this is my model. Also, I try so hard. Always keep going and learning more. Um, but sure, you know, out there and um, you have a fair background in that area and you're learning on the basis of, um, you know, a, a fair expertise already. So query, you know, what's going on over there? How do you feel it's doing? How do you feel, you know, the politics, the, the, the social structure, uh, the economics? How does it feel? Oh, that's such a juicy question, Jay, and I could I could do a seminar on it. So let me encapsulate it as best I can. Uh, so a little bit of background. Laos is the smallest of the mainland Southeast Asian countries. It is completely landlocked. It is a country of about 8 million people. Uh, to the north is the People's Republic of China, which is 1.4 billion people. To their east is Vietnam, which is going on 100 million people. To their west, the long border they share with Thailand, that is somewhere over 75 million people. So Laos, by comparison, is tiny. It is doesn't have the type of access to the open ocean as China does, as Vietnam does, as Thailand does. And they they have to find their way, obviously, uh, being scrunched by giants. That's that's essentially their challenge. So they have become uh, from what I can tell, pretty good at hedging. They're good hedgers. The Vietnamese are also extremely good hedgers. The Thais are very good hedgers. And Cambodia is so, uh, so enwrapped in the, 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 the family dynasty of one Hun Sen, who has been there for decades and decades and decades, is in kind of uh, the, the emperor there for all, all, for all purposes. So Lao is particularly challenged by being scrunched by giants. And what they have done is now clearly the Chinese are dominant for a whole bunch of reasons. And you know who else would have ponied up $6 billion for a high-speed train from their northern frontier town of Boten all the way down to Bintian, which the Chinese hope, the Chinese hope, you know, will lead to the Thais uh, going high-speed rail all the way from the south of Bangkok, which is the Gulf of Thailand, all the way from the Gulf of Bangkok through Bangkok, up to northern Thailand, across the Mekong, and then connecting with the train in Vientiane. That is their, they very much want that. Now, whether the Thais are ever going to do that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a bigger player than Lao. And if they see it in their benefit, they will. 
but uh, there's not an internal champion as of late, as I, that I can tell in, in Thailand, who's willing to go in that direction anytime in the near in the near future, although they talk about it. So Lao has become, I think, very good at, uh, not manipulating, but taking advantage of being a small player in a, in a, in a neighborhood that is, has many, many much larger pay, players and people who can, in other countries, can be bullies. And they, they, they leverage their, their position with the U.S., with the Europeans, uh, and with other countries. Uh, and, and interestingly, because I read the Lao Press every single day, the, the coverage regarding the United States is, by and large, quite positive. It's quite positive, which is really striking because, on some level, because, of course, you know, the, what I call the gift that, that keeps on giving, and this is, of course, uh, you know, it's, uh, putting it in a, uh, in, a, in a weird spin, but I mean, Lao was bombed more per capita than any other country on the face of the earth throughout history with the U.S. bombing from 1964 to 1973. And people continue to die each and every year from the UXO, whether it's children playing with so-called bombies, which are little anti-personnel bombs the size of an orange, or whether it's a farmer in his or her field uh, tapping at the ground and hitting a mine. But so Agent there's orange. quite is Agent Orange there? No, there wasn't. As far as I know, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of chemical defoliant here in Vietnam. It was, I mean, excuse me, Lao. It was, it was just bombing, 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 bombing. So fortunate, and, and the United States, to its credit, continues to spend millions of dollars a year to help the Laotian government uh, demine and deal with the UXOs. So. I guess, kind of in summary, Jay, the the government in, in Vientiane has been very good at being able to accept proffered aid and assistance and grants from the Japanese, from the Koreans, from the Swiss, from other Europeans, from the EU, and from the Americans. So, in a sense, that that helps them to offset the overwhelming presence of China uh, and as well a strong presence of Vietnam. So, you know, who am I to judge, but I'll judge nonetheless. They seem to be doing a pretty reasonable job of accepting assistance and not pissing any particular party off uh, because the money keeps on flowing and they're very, very keen on continuing their development path. And just kind of as a sidebar note, uh, when I was here in the early 2020, right before COVID, uh, One dollar got you about 9,000, 9,000 kip, okay? Right now, the exchange rate is one dollar will get you about 17,000 kip. So the currency is devalued tremendously, and that has put a terrible, terrible squeeze in the Lao economy because they need hard currency to buy fertilizer. They need hard currency to buy petroleum products, and 40% of the country is still involved in farming. Now, you don't see that in the glitzy malls of Vientiane. You don't see that walking in the pristine peninsula along the Mekong here in Luang Prabang. But there are still a, a large, large portion of the Laotian people who are really, really struggling because uh, things have become so expensive and tourism is only now starting to kind of pick back up after they reopened earlier this year based on, uh, on COVID clobbering them. So. You, you suggested earlier that uh, the government was stable. <laughs> and uh, I, I take from that that um, the, the government doesn't get in the way of the development of the country. Uh, and further, that uh, there is public safety. All that true? Uh, public safety, I would say, you know, comparatively speaking, uh, you know, compared to uh, the United States, yes, it's safe. Uh, as far as uh, the government, I mean, and I'm not uh, not going too too far past the line here because it's is covered in the Lao press as well. There is a, a significant corruption problem here, and I, I'm being understated when I say that. For example, if you uh, take a, uh, a van or a tuk tuk uh, outside of downtown Vientiane and you go to a place called Buddha Park, which I've actually been to, it's kind of cool. It's right by the, it's on the Mekong and across the Mekong Sea, northern Thailand. 
So you cruise along the Mekong there in your van going to Buda Park, and you see uh, on the, uh, the riverside of the, the road, you see these palatial, and I mean palatial mansions, huge, monstrous estates that are along the Mekong there. And uh, I, I was asking my driver yesterday as we were going to the station to be in Chen, I said, you know, those, those mansions I see along going to Buddha Park, he started to chuckle because I think he knew what the question was going to be. I said, who lives in those mansions? And he just kind of shook his head and he said, dark money, dark money. Oh, really? Interesting. Money. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and you see Ferraris, you'll see, a, you know, a $300,000 red spank and new Ferrari in the streets of Vian Chan. I can tell you, there's nowhere uh, close to Vian Chan to wind out a Ferrari. But you have these, 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 these gaudy, statuses of richness of riches with that you know the cost of a ferrari is more than a village will make in an entire year so there's a disparity between a very small number of haves and a whole, a whole lot of have-nots and even the lao government and the party are uh, are aware of the corruption and they they make some efforts to do it but you know uh, th that is that is one of my biggest beefs jay regarding one party monopolistic control uh, in any society and it just so happens you know that i'm in a one rule here that's ruled by dominant communist party is that there is a lack of accountability uh there's not, not a judiciary <clears throat> that's independent that can check there's not a competing power that's independent that can check so that that is one one of my biggest beefs against um, you know one party rule anywhere and it's certainly the case here let me uh, shift now, Marco. I, I like to <clears throat> go up closer than fifty thousand foot level, um, and ask you about how you know how things are doing vis-a-vis -vis interaction with the world. Um, I know it's not the same as looking at how India, for example, interacts, or Africa, or Europe, of course. Um, but I wonder, you know, for example, how. How have they been affected by COVID? How are they being affected right now um, by COVID? Um, that's my first question. What What is happening in terms of public health? In terms of public health, well, what comes to mind immediately is that uh, it's only a small minority of people who are wearing masks. Uh, I found that to be, well, public places certainly People are very, very, very largely masked less. Even in the train yesterday and in the station to be in Chen, people were masked less. So there seems to be, I'd say, the overall vibe that COVID is in the rearview mirror. That said, as I walk around downtown Luang Prabang, and I compare it to when I was here early 2020, more storefronts are closed. There are more for sale signs. I've, I speak to, to business people wherever I go. I've gotten to know <clears throat> the manager of my favorite uh, cafe here is called the Zurich Zurich Bakery and Cafe. It's, it's actually a, a Thai outfit. Uh, so the, the, the manager there, his name is Talk, and he, he he's Thai, but he's the manager there, uh, the Zurich Cafe here in Wang Kabong. So I make it a point, you know, businessman to businessman, how are things going? You know, what's it been like for you? What's the revenue? I ended up not asking too many knows the questions about well, what percentage are you down? But they're really quite forthcoming as far as, you know, it's still a struggle. And so tourism is yet to come back uh, anywhere close to full strength. And it, I mean, it's still, it's still tough. And I haven't gone to the other side of the river yet, which I've done before. So there is a ferry which spends all day, all day, all day, going back and forth across the river here in Luangkabang. And I did it when I was here last, you can go by, by, by foot, you can go by bicycle, you can, you can take your scooter, you can take your car. And I, I plan to do it in the days to come. And it, it's truly kind of an otherworldly experience because on the other side of the river is more the real Lao in this area, which is very rural. Luang Prabang is a UNESCO city. It is very well kept up where the tourists go. It's, uh, it's very, very impressive, but you just go across the river and that is, it, it's truly uh, a great contrast. So how are the people doing? That they're still struggling and there, there is a substantial concern that you know, it's going to be a long slog back for many people in, in Laos. So, you know, COVID is still, you know, it, uh, 
you're not reading, I'm not reading about people hospitalized or about case counts going up, but it is, it is a, a slow and it's going to be a long recovery. Now that said, you know, one of the, the big wild cards here is when are the Chinese going to open up their borders for more widespread travel? Because this train line starts in the southern city of uh, Kunming in Yunnan province. And there will, not if, but when, there will be uh, many, many Chinese uh, who will be traveling from southern China into Lao, into Luang Prabang. And that's going to have uh, uh, effects on the economy, on the culture, on the vibe of the place that, uh, that will be substantial. Let's talk about the Chinese. Uh, you, you mentioned about the high-speed train and all that and the $6 billion. Gee, you know, wouldn't it be nice if Hawaii had that kind of money uh, and that kind of train? It probably didn't take all that long to build a train, but that's not our show today. Uh, so the question is, uh, is this part of the One Belt, One Road, Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, is, is this a, maybe a debt trap between uh, China and Laos? Yes, to your first question, definitely part of One Belt, One Road. Uh, debt trap, uh, that's preloaded because, uh, you know, the, the Chinese will swear up and down that no, 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 we're not doing that. But I mean, truth be told, uh, according to the World Bank analysts and according to other uh, what I'll call reasonably objective analysts, the, the debt ratio uh, compared to income and GDP of Laos is amongst the highest in the world. Um, you know, we, yeah, I don't know if you've been reading over the months what's been happening in Sri Lanka. I mean, that, that has been an example of, I call, call a, pretty much a failed state, you know, and they went in deep with the Chinese regarding a port there. So the, 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 the Lao China Railway, LCR, as it's called, is 70% owned by the Chinese, 30% owned by Lao. So, you know, I, I'm not privy to the balance sheets or the spreadsheets as far as how they're going to make up on their investment. But I mean, $6 billion is a lot of money. And there is, like I said, a lot of concern on the part of many economists that Laos is in a precarious position given the small size of its economy and given the billions involved in, in terms of the debt it has to service. But the Chinese have made very, very clear, and, and I, I take them at their word for, for this when they say it, you know, they're not gonna let Laos slip into some type of uh, you know, critical state when it comes to, to debt. That would not serve their interests. No, so. but there's all kinds of gradient between the two extremes. I mean, you can take over um, and um, you can not take over. You can let them, let them coast on the loan. Or you can renegotiate the loan, change the terms, maybe change the duration of it. <clears throat> so uh, I don't have an idea about what China has in mind here. I don't know if China has an idea about what China has in mind. But it seems to me that as we go forward on on Belt Road, one road, Belt and Road, it, it, there's there's always the possibility of a debt trap, and debt traps come in many flavors and many mm -hmm. gradations. So, and it would seem to me just uh, uh, just like um, other countries in Southeast Asia uh, and Sri Lanka, especially, um, Laos is is uh, exposed to the possibility. Uh, they may not, you know, you said their economy not doing that well. Uh, they may not be able to get the cash together um, to pay whatever the, the freight is on that loan. Well, they're definitely in a more precarious position than their neighbors simply because of their size, as I mentioned, and because they um, uh, they have less means. <clears throat> but you know, interestingly, the, the Vietnamese see Laos is also very important to their national interest. They share a very, very long border, border with Laos. They're two communist parties are, are very buddy-buddy. So the, the Chinese are, excuse me, the Vietnamese are doing their best to uh, uh, make sure that their brothers and sisters in Vientiane understand how important they are to Hanoi. And uh, it's, not, it's not to the interest of Hanoi to allow Lao to spin too far into the Chinese orbit. So there's a very interesting dynamic between between the, the three parties. And, and interesting, again, they're all run by a monopolistic uh, communist party. So, you know, my take on Lao is that they seem to know what they're doing, you know, corruption aside, which should not be minimized. Uh, and they know how to work with suitors, whether it's the Thais, the Vietnamese, the Europeans, 
the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Americans, they seem to be pretty good at playing the game of not so much putting their hand out, but uh, thankfully receiving what is being provided by other much larger powers. And, you know, just as a little sidebar note, uh, Barack Obama was here in 2016, his last full year in office, of course. <clears throat> and uh, he took a stroll along the Lung Prabang, Lung and Mekong. And there is there are a number of coconut, cold coconut stands and smoothie stands along the Mekong. And he stopped at one, of course, surrounded by a security detail. And he took a coconut you know, that was, was pristine, right? <laughs> there was, it wasn't going to be poison because no one knew he was going to stop and get a coconut. So they take a coconut out of a great big cooler. They, they, stop, they, they slice off the top and they put a straw in. So in this particular coconut stand, of course, the owner uh, was very pleased and took a lot, number of photos of showing Barack Obama with his coconut, you know, sipping coconut water. So it's just interesting that, that uh, you know, Obama, in the last year of his office, he chose to focus on or reiterate the American interest in staying active and engaged in the region. And I, I can't I can't say enough about how important that is. And when I spoke to my friend, my new friend at the embassy in Vientiane, he said, you know, what's most important out here? And he said, you know, the U.S. has to continue to show up. We have to continue to show up. And we did over the past month or so. We had um, President Biden, who was at the ASEAN meeting in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. We had Biden, who was at the G20 in Bali, uh, in Indonesia also after he went to Phnom Penh. We had Vice President Kamala Harris, who was at the APEC, uh, Asian Pacific Economic Community, uh, who, in Bangkok. So, I mean, this is really, really, really important because, I mean, it doesn't take somebody with a PhD in political science to observe that during the Trump years, you know, with this America first business, you know, uh, many of our relationships with key allies kind of took a big hit. So regardless of who succeeds Joe Biden, you know, it, it's so important, in my opinion, that the U.S. continue, continue to continue, continue to be a very visible presence here. And it's, it's a very vitally strategic region, not just mainland Southeast Asia, but the the uh, ocean based Southeast Asian states of ASEAN. So, you know, and there's nobody, you know, I don't want to sound too much like a headstrong American, but there's nobody else that can offset the Chinese the way the Americans can in the region. So it's absolutely critical, in my opinion, that we stay very active, very engaged here and not just parachute people in, but that we, because, you know, I don't want to generalize too much, but Asians are very big on face. They, they know full well, the rank of the people who the host country or the, the, the other country send over. So it's a big deal when a president or vice president comes. Well, good. We're finally realizing the pivot. You know, it was in suspense during the Trump years uh, or worse. And um, now we're getting back to it. It's, I agree totally. It's very important. And you never know. You never know where it pops up. You know, for example, I think our, our diplomatic relations with India could have been better and if they had been better, India wouldn't be siding with Russia now because of the oil. Uh, and that goes for every country in, you know, in the region. Um, we want to be friendly with them. We want to be somebody reliable, right, on into the future. And, and you mentioned earlier that um, you know, they like Americans. But where, where does their loyalty truly fit? Because they, they have to be nimble. Uh, they have to be able to you know, change their relationships as necessary to protect themselves, to you know, get the best deal to save themselves. Um, and the question is, you know, how, what, what kind of view of America do they have? What kind of view of Russia do they have? I mean, China's right there at the border. Got to be careful. And right now, China is in a bit of a turmoil. I'm not sure how that affects everything. Um, but I would say that all of those countries have got to be clever. India has been clever, and, and that's a good example of um, the, necess the need for cleverness. And so where does Lao fit? Where do the other countries in Southeast Asia fit? Um, how do they see the U.S. over the long term? How do they see Russia, China, India? How do they, how do they what's their true loyalty? Jay, I could, I could give a, a lecture on each country's uh, trilateral or multilateral diplomacy. So to try to encapsulate the whole region, 
uh, you know, as an academic in, in a few minutes, that's, that's, that's too much of a challenge for me, but I'm just gonna maybe use Vietnam as an example. Uh, they made very clear and it's very explicit that uh, they're, not, they're not gonna pursue alliances with anyone that would possibly alienate some other country. So they essentially, they wanna be friends with all and allied with nobody. So I think they in particular have played a very, very good and strategic game at cultivating relations. I mean, they can't get away from the fact that they share a border with, with the People's Republic of China. And they can't get away from the history that so much of Vietnam for so long was dominated by, by the Chinese to the North. They, they, they can't get that. They're acutely aware of that. So they, they don't wanna have a shooting war as happened in 79 uh, so, and the relations between the Chinese and the Vietnamese economically is huge, but at the same time, they realize, well, we're close to China in many more ways than one, but we have to be very careful. So they are very strategic in maintaining relations with the Americans and with Moscow. So two other major players. So I think they've, they've done a pretty darn good job. And I, uh, I think, you know, my take is that especially the relationship between Hanoi and Washington will continue to be of, of great, great importance to the Vietnamese, uh, not least of which uh, because we can offset, like no one else can, Chinese uh, projection of power in the South China Sea, what the Vietnamese call the East Sea. So I think kind of in summary form, each country is able to leverage the assets it has to, to try to maintain good relations with other foreign powers and not, not become too, uh, too dominated by any one particular, despite the fact that let's say in Laos and Cambodia, especially the Chinese presence is so strong in terms of investment money, in terms of just the Chinese presence uh, in general. So uh, I think they're all good hedgers. They're, they all have their own intrinsic challenges based on their geography, based on the politics, but I think overall, they're all fairly good hedgers. You know, if you look at the old Hong Kong, look at Singapore, uh, and, and to a large extent, uh, China itself, um, you saw that uh, their young people, their students were traveling around the world and educating themselves. Um, sometimes they'd stay at their um, student destinations, and, but many times they'd come back and there was an exchange, call it an educational business exchange going on. And that was good for everybody. Um, and it's, you know, some countries in Southeast Asia, I'm sure have more of it, some have less of it. But it interacts with my question, which I always ask you, and anyone who is in Southeast Asia, what is the future leadership for the entire region? I mean, they would be so much stronger, as, as Latin America would be, if they could get together and not be distracted uh, with small issues and, and talk like a continent, you know, same thing with Africa. And, and I'm hoping in, in our lifetimes, or maybe soon thereafter, um, that we see this happen. Um, but every time I ask anybody about Southeast Asia, it's nah, never going to happen, never, never, never. But you know, there's a linkage between that possibility and the, this uh, educational exchange I'm talking about. And I wonder if you see, you meet people who have been involved in that exchange, who have gone to Europe or the US or really anywhere, um, to you know, do outreach and to learn about business and global affairs, and, and then come back to Lao or any other place in South in Southeast Asia and say, "Look, I I can show you a few things. I can show you how to deal with the Chinese. I can show you how to do high finance. I can show you how to make a better country. And furthermore, I can show you about diplomacy with other countries in the region because ultimately, I want to be a leader and you know to emerge as a leader." A, a national leadership in in the area. Do you see any of that? Oh, that's a great point. <clears throat> I haven't I haven't taken much of a dive into that, honestly, Jay. Uh, at the same time, uh, I see it as enormously important, and unfortunately, there there's a segment of the American population and in Washington that sees spending money to bring young people from overseas into the U.S. for education as being some type of foreign aid and uh, we don't we need to keep the money at home type of attitude 
And I find that to be uh, very, very short-sighted and very lamentable. Uh, and again, I haven't looked at the data or the numbers uh, as far as what USAID has been spending or what uh, the United States government has been spending in general. But I mean, if I were a king or at least a prince in this regard, you know, I would dramatically increase the amount of U.S. dollars to uh, many countries in the world, and especially strategic countries in the world like Southeast Asia, to encourage young Lao, uh, Vietnamese, Cambodians, people from Myanmar, Thais, to come to the U.S. to study, because uh, that is a, a, an incredibly important investment on so many levels. And my impression is that that has taken a hit over the past years is because as the United States has become, at least a large segment of the United States, a substantial segment has become more insular and more kind of xenophobic. So I see that as, uh, as incredibly important. I mean, uh, to go back to kind of uh, part of your question, you know, there is this thing called ASEAN, which is the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, right? It's made up of 10 countries, five here in the mainland, and then you have Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, and Brunei. And they, they get together regularly and, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, weakness in ASEAN in terms of it being a proactive body. It is, it is limited in terms of its power and it's, being really, it's really being tested now because one of its members, Myanmar, is, you know, and in the, the top Mada, the, the government, the, not the government, the military there, of course, overthrew uh, Aung San Suu Kyi February of last year. So there's an active war going on in, one, in an ASEAN state. And, you know, I, I read this stuff really regularly. And even ASEAN is getting rather peeved with, with Myanmar. And typically, you know, it's just bad form to get peeved with an ASEAN member and call out an ASEAN member. Now, in terms of sending a peacekeeping force or trying to trying to do a more muscled approach to uh, making peace there, that is, not, that is not ASEAN. But right now, ASEAN is as good as it gets in terms of a multilateral, multi-nation forum and organization. Now, is, is that gonna morph at some point to an European Union? I mean, well, and look at the EU these days, you know, the, the Brits pulled out and it's fractured more now than it has been for a long, long time. So. You know, the move towards supra, S-U-P-R-A, supranationality, seems to be kind of on the wane these days. And I don't see ASEAN going in that direction anytime soon because there seems to be, you know, the, the trend is in the opposite direction in terms of greater fragmentation. But I mean, ASEAN is as good as it gets right now. And it's better than nothing because what was it? Churchill said that jaw to jaw is better than war war. So I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling here. Well, you know, talk about trends, um, you know, we're all following the, the trends around the country um, to autocracy and away from democracy and representative government. And uh, it seems to be inexorable. I mean, we're going to have a good day and a bad day, a good news day, a bad news day. Um, but at the end of the week, the year, uh, I think the trend is visible and it's toward autocracy. It's toward strongman leadership. And it's, um, it's away from democracy, sad to say. Not only in the U.S., although it is happening in the U.S., but other places. What's the trend in Southeast Asia? What's the trend in law? We have, you know, representative government. Do we have what we can call democracy? Do we have civil liberties and bill of rights? What do we have? Well, kind of one by one. I mean, let's look at Vietnam. Vietnam monopolistic communist party. Uh, from my take is that the, the screws are being tightened. Uh, in some degrees in Vietnam in terms of internet control. I mean, you know, just kind of a little sidebar note. So there is uh, an excellent source of information about Asia called The Diplomat. The Diplomat is thediplomat.com. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a pay for service. I pay 60 bucks a year and I have, uh, and it's a great, great source of information for across Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, all across Asia. And I was in, in Hanoi a couple weeks ago and uh, I was at that website and I wanted to, I clicked on a, a, an analytical piece on Vietnam and China. Uh, guess what happened? It wouldn't load up. I thought, oh, that's strange. So I went back to the previous page, the, the, the homepage of the diplomat. Oh, it's fine. Went back to the, uh, the, the piece on China and Vietnam. I wouldn't load up. And I thought, oh, hmm. well, I happened to travel with a VPN, virtual private network. 
So I thought, well, I'm going to do a little experiment. So I switched to my VPN and it, it loaded up. And then I went to the, uh, the piece on uh, Vietnam and China. Guess what? It opened up. No problem. So that gave me a personal uh, firsthand experience of censorship in Vietnam. Uh, so I see the overall trend in Vietnam is either static or it's in decline in terms of, uh, of greater freedom. Uh, Lao, I mean, as far as I can tell, there's no internet censorship. I've never come across a page that has been blocked. So that, that's to their credit. Uh, Thailand, no censorship, uh, but you know, they've been controlled by a military, call it what it is, Prayut Chan Ocha, the general turned prime minister, who's now been in power for eight years and who apparently plans to run for re-election next year. So, you know, Thailand has this dance that they do between quasi-democracy and coup after coup after coup after coup. There have been, uh, gosh, dozens of coups in the past 32 years since the constitutional or since the absolute monarchy was abolished in 1932. So, you know, what's the prospect from true democracy in Thailand? I'd say quite minimal because the military is so strong. You have the monarchy and you have the business class. Uh, Cambodia has been ruled by uh, uh, a fiefdom of Hun Sen since the 1980s, and his, uh, uh, what does he call it, um, it's the PP party, it's the uh, People's Progress Party, uh, I, I may be missing on the acronym, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, there is no political competition in Cambodia. It's Hun Sen, Hun Sen, Hun Sen, Hun Sen, and his family. The guy's been in power for 30 years, and he's grooming his son, Hun Manet, to take over for him at some point. And Manette, interestingly, is a graduate from the US uh, Army Academy at West Point, so go figure. And then uh, where else do we have? Myanmar is a mess. Uh, you know, people are dying trying to fight a dictatorial, uh, brutal government. So the prospects for democracy in Myanmar uh, doesn't look promising. Am I leaving anybody out? Uh, so, I mean, the prospects for democracy here in the region are, are not good. And Lao, finally, you know, uh, despite the optimism of my local driver yesterday, uh, I think it's, uh, it's unlikely that any time in the near future there's going to be, you know, real political competition here in Laos. So, uh, you know, this uh, you know, is going to be what it's going to be, and each country will develop to the best of its ability and, and, re and regard. I mean, this is real politic, you know, to the nth degree. The United States has to, of course, take, a, take into account that uh, much of the world is not democratic, a growing part of the world is not democratic, and we have uh, real and tangible uh, security interests, national security interests, and national interests at writ large here that we have to continue to cultivate and protect in a very challenging environment where there are some major players here that would just as soon we get in all our boats and our planes and we go back across the Pacific and we allow other powers here to become even more dominant than they already are. Hmm. I have one last uh, one last point I'd like to discuss with you. We only we're over. We only have a minute to to discuss it, and it's this. A few days ago, we had a show with a linguistics professor uh, from Seminole, as it were. Very interesting guy, and he speaks a number of languages. And um, what, I said, why, why? What is it about the language that interests you so much? Is it is it you like you like the sound of the language? Do you do you like looking at the culture of the place through the language or with the language? And uh, what we concluded in this discussion back and forth was that all of that, yes, of course, but learning another language and learning another culture helps you understand yourself because you have you have the the sounding board. It's a cultural sounding board. And I suggest that although you are an academic and you are always engaged in learning and you learn so much, but there you are in Lao and it's more than that. You are you have a sounding board. You go to these places all over Southeast Asia and you're learning as much about yourself as you are about them. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. Jay, I think you put it beautifully, just beautifully that it's... Uh... Yes, it's an incredibly uh, powerful, and it's an understatement, powerful interactive experience. And you, know, you just can't beat, uh, you can't beat being on the ground and talking, walking and talking and breathing 
uh, and, and watching people. When I was at this mall in Vientiane just a couple of days ago, I thought, Dude, this could be a mall in Bangkok, it could be a, a, a mall in Hilo and Honolulu in New York, you know. And, and it seems to almost be that, you know, uh, it, it's a mark of modernity that uh, a developing country to kind of say, hey, we've made it. We've made it. One of those marks of modernity is to have a modern, multi-level shopping mall. <laughs> and I, I'm not into shopping all that much, but I'm into people watching. So I went to this, it's called the Parkson Mall, P-A-R-K-S-O-N. And I think it's the most modern mall probably in all of Lao. And I went there twice, not because I needed to go shopping twice, but just because it's a fascinating place to watch people. And, you know, and then I'll just kind of leave you with this. One of the things that struck me as I thought about it is there weren't many older people. And I consider myself an older person, you know. There weren't that many older people walking about. I'm talking about people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. This was predominantly teenagers and people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And I thought, why is that? Why is that? Where are the older people? Do they not have the desire to go to the mall? Do they not have the money to go to the mall? I don't know, but I just was kind of struck by the mall seems to be a, a, a phenomenon and a magnet for younger people, whereas the older folks, I don't know why. I just thought of that in the past day or so, so I don't have an answer for it. So this is kind of a puzzler yeah. for me. But Well, it's as just much a statement about the future as it yeah. is about the present. Well, th thank you, Marco. Marco Mangelsdorf for uh, joining us on LAO. We really appreciate your getting on with us and uh, appreciate all your lessons. Thanks so much. I look forward to talking with you again. Well, it's been a pleasure to reconnect with you, my friend, uh, Jay. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, I'm going to be in LAO for another month or so. So I hope we can connect again and continue the conversation. So mahalo nui. Okay. So, and say say goodbye in the, in the, in the local language, would you? Oh, goodness. Uh, I think it's said, I'll just say, which is thank you very much. I knew you'd say that. Uh, thank you, Marco. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.